teach you how to stop Satan right at his root. And God, and God loves the fact I'm going to share this. But you have to prepare your heart to hear what I'm going to tell you. Some of it's going to be familiar. Some of it's not going to be familiar. But one thing it's going to do is it's going to give you homework on you and God working together to cut the root of the enemy's inroads into our life. Y'all up for that? Yeah. Amen. So we've been doing a series called New Creation Realities. What we have is new creatures in Christ. Amen. And I believe the church, a lot of the times, now not to pick on just generally, the church, a lot of times in my, back when I was saved, if you didn't have a good pastor, most pastors just condemned everybody, forced them up to the altar. Ah, there's some, I know somebody out there's got something wrong with them. <laughs> if that's you, jump up on your seat and come to the altar. That's just the old Pentecostal trick. Everybody has things wrong with them. The key is for us not to focus on ourselves, but to focus on the Lord healing these things. Amen. How? Let me ask yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, let me ask you a question. I mean, there's one over here to you need to ask a question. I want somebody over there. Okay. Sit with him. Okay. The question is, okay, remember? The question is, how easily do you get offended? Ask him, how easy do you get offended? Terry, how easy do you get offended? Marvin, how easy do you get offended? This is how we regulate our walk with the Lord. If you find yourself always offended, who's going to always offend you? Amen. And the people that are thinking about themselves, listen, listen to me carefully, I'm not picking on you. If you're always thinking about yourself, it doesn't matter. If somebody corrects you, you're going to take it personally and you're going to have an attitude about it. You don't want to be that way because it will keep you as a baby Christian and you'll never grow. You never grow. I like to test mature Christians. The other day, well, it's been some time now, went to the fair and I, I went around and, and talked to Christian ministries. And you'd be surprised how insecure and unfounded they, they are at times. Why do you want to ask me these questions? I want to see where you're at. You're a brand new Christian. I wish somebody would ask me these questions when I was younger. You see, when you enter the ministry, Satan doesn't like that. He just wants you to be a quiet, barely get along type of Christian. And because you're up in years, you don't have to try as hard. You can't teach old dog new tricks. Ruff. Yes, you can. You're not an old dog to Jesus. You're a young pup. Now, let's get the childlike attitudes that we need to have. Second thing that I want to point out to you is very, very important. Don't let, write this down, don't let what you do for God outweigh your time with God. Sometimes we can really be busy and we can really kind of last minute and throw everything together but we're all wore out and we're all beat how many know when you're tired you're not always in the spirit look at your neighbor and smile and says yeah i know that's true all right so a couple of things remember when you come to church treat this as god's drinking hole you're coming here to partake remember jesus at the well there's a good ex expression jesus went out of his way to meet this woman at the well at noon she never drew in the morning where everybody else was in there because she was the town tart. She slept with everybody and she was just a loose woman. But Jesus went out of her way because, do you know why? Because she had a lineage and a love for God. God always goes out of his way when you share your love for God and it's not about you. So make sure what you do for God doesn't outweigh your love for God and your time with God. Say amen, somebody. All right. Write that down in the leaflet of your Bible. All right. So amen. Let's get into our, our scripture and let's get into the new creation reality. Today's is going to be exposing the big lie. Exposing the big lies, the name, sub name of this. So amen. Good morning to you. This is the day the Lord hath made. Amen. Folks, what does the enemy feed on? 
What? Lies. Well, lies. lies is okay, but that's a product of. What does the enemy feed on? He feeds on you opposing things. He feeds on you being angry at someone, opposing someone, having to argue, being stirred up. That's what the enemy feeds on. Now you know why there's wars, rumors of wars. That's nation will rise up against nation. The idea is these are the feeding engines that feed the vampire Satan. Satan always requires blood. Every civilization that he was involved in starting, by the way, the oldest religion next to God is Lucifer's religion. You can go every place in the world Every major civilization all worshiped the serpent. They might have called him Baal. They might have called him Naga. They might have called him all these different names. But Satan saw to it that humanity was going to be his slave race. And we're going to worship him and not God. So he's the author of opposition. If he could, folks, he would turn you against yourself. What's it say in James? A double-minded man is what? Ah, so what happens is he comes in and let's say you have a beautiful marriage. He tries to wiggle in between you and get each of you to have an opinion that's against the other. Tries to get you into competition. Christians, terrible at this. You know, people come in and say, why is your church this way? Because I'm not competing about the church up the street. They're supposed to do it God the way God instructed them. We're supposed to do it the way God instructed us, you see. But see what competition does, if it's not done rightly, creates strife. And what does Satan feed on? What does he do? He, he feeds your head with all kinds of lies since you were a little kid. Then when we get saved, we have to renew our mind. Otherwise, there will be things in our thinking that will literally oppose what God wants to do in our heart and our life. Can I have an Amen. So that's why we need to cast down imagination. So Satan's job, biggest key, biggest inroad is to get you to oppose someone, something, or to oppose yourself. Everyone think about that for just a minute and then say, I got it. That's why we meet with God and that's why we pray with God. So he filters a lot of that stuff out. Amen. Now, a person that walks in love doesn't think of themselves. They think of others more than themselves. For example, my job is not to, to, to override you. I love this, and, and this has nothing to do with today because I know after service we, we do Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 means that they went from house to house and did break their, their bread with gladness and did honor the Lord. That's what we do after church. So we try to do that so it builds bonds and all. But Satan hates that kind of stuff. Amen. So he tries to get in there and mess it all up. And so what will happen is every time an issue is brought up, somebody's either going to oppose it or agree with it. Say amen. So let's take you back. Remember the Genesis way back when God created Adam and Eve? Were they perfect? I'm going to give my water, sorry. Yes, were they, were they perfect? Yes. And so, I, I love this because my foot caught on the rug there. Amen. My other foot saw my other foot. He would go, whoa. All right. In Genesis, we see the serpent coming in in Genesis chapter 3. What does he do? He says, now God had just got through telling Adam and Eve, of every tree of the garden you may there eat, freely eat thereof. It's all for you. But the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, especially the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat thereof. For the moment you eat it, you're going to die. So that tells us that it wasn't Adam's disobedience to God that killed him. It was something also in the tree. We know that. Say amen. But what did Satan do? He got Eve to oppose God's word. He said, did God really say that? Look, it's a beautiful fruit. It will make you wise. 
you'll become just like God and know good and evil. No, they already knew all they needed to know. Adam named everything. Totally a genius. And now Satan is going to get them to oppose God so he can feed off the humanity. And so we see in Genesis that they ate of the tree, hiding in the bushes, blaming everybody else. Where art thou, Adam? And so Adam said, and he says, do you eat the fruit? And he says, it was the woman you gave me God. We all know the funny part of that. But notice what happened. Now Adam and Eve were in opposition to God. What feeds Satan? Our opposition to God. Amen. Like, for example, I might say something one time, and it might offend you, and God forbid. I'm not here to try to offend anybody. Nor am I trying to manipulate you through the words of my mouth. I don't believe in that kind of preaching. I'm going to give you the word of God, but some say I might do something or I say something that the enemy says, ah, see, recognize that. Recognize not what was done, not what offended you. Recognize who's behind it. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, four realms of demonic creations. All fell with Lucifer. Okay, four of them. <coughs> <clears throat> I sang a lot today. With all of that, there's little imps that work along with him. They all function on your disobedience to God. They all function on our opposing things. Right? So God says, Adam, have you eaten of the tree? I was afraid and it was the woman you gave me. Opposing God. And then what happens? God fixes them. He, he covers them. He starts to work with them. And that group went over in one area. And the rest of Cain's group went over into another area. So it split. Okay. Now, what happened to Cain and Abel? They got to opposing one another, didn't they? I would venture to say, my guess that they got into competition. Who could love God better? And, and then when God had respect to Abel's offering and not to Cain's, Cain did what? He should have said, Lord, I'm repent. I did it wrong. No. He moved into opposition and it stirred him up so bad Satan got the foothold and ended up using Cain to kill Abel. Hello? Look at your neighbor and say, yikes. So in other words, we don't want to play with the enemy. And you need to understand how he works. But what I have to tell you today will cut him right out of, you, out of your life, out of your children's life. Do you believe that? Well, if you don't, I don't know what to tell you. But what I'm telling you is the absolute truth. So the key with Cain and Abel is to realize, everybody said, I want, must realize that I represent Cain and Abel. Okay. So your Abel is your spirit and your soul. That came from God. Can you say amen? But your flesh came from mom and dad. Mom and dad have a curse in them. Bless their hearts. As much as they want to have a perfect child, Look what was born. I'm pointing at myself. You see? Thought I was going to be a girl. Look what happened. They did. But anyway, you think about it. So immediately once I'm born, God has a purpose for me. So Satan immediately goes to operation to try to get me to oppose myself when I'm a young child. What feeds the enemy? Us opposing things. Getting angry. Being frustrated. Being Angry at someone else. Strife is, an, is the word for it. Hello, are you with me? So everyone say, my flesh is Cain and my spirit is Abel. With God in it, I can do all things through Christ. You see, so your flesh 
is to die daily. We know that. Because Satan needs your flesh to trick you with it. He needs your negative thinking to trick you into things. He needs you to focus on yourself so you'll be depressed. So you'll talk yourself into things like stupid stuff like suicide and all that. Don't ever mention that, you selfish person. People that really commit suicide don't tell anybody. They just do it. Grow up. You want attention. Stop running around saying I'm unworthy. We know that. We see you. And you see me. I'm unworthy. But God made me worthy. Focus on that. Not yourself, what you can do for God. How is your prayer life? You know, as a younger pastor, I was a little more aggressive. <laughs> God forbid. And I'd go around and interview my leaders. How's your prayer life? What have you been doing this week? Man, I had a day that I did that. Just went around and visited everybody. They knew I had that day. And guess who was all gone during that day? More than anything, God wants us to be able to handle the time in which we live. Do you believe that? Has he equipped us to do that? So what did he do? He turned. At the beginning, he turned Adam against Eve. It was the woman you gave me. He turned against God. Cain killed Abel. And on and on and on and on. All through history, Satan needing the angry, the stripedness of our flesh to continue to feed on. Every major civilization, Inca, Aztec, Mayan, European, Indian, Greek, all got into blood sacrifices because Satan requires blood to mock God with. Every tribe in the world have some form of a covenant that where they cut and drink the blood. It's a perversion of the true covenant. But see, Satan wants that power. He wants the rule and reign, not over in the world, but over each one of us. How dare us have the king of kings and the Lord of lords in us? How dare us walk around in victory telling others about Jesus Christ? Now, have you got to the point that every distraction other than focusing on God, doing what God wants you to do, and winning souls, that is what we're all to be focused on and not ourselves. what we could do for Jesus. Listen, God can make a donkey sing. You see the idea behind that? So let's stay humble and let, let God put these donkeys together. Amen. I want a band. I want to worship. But I don't want you so beat up that I have to pray you in every Sunday because you haven't got your act together. A, a person that gets up on the stage and worships got to be an example to all. Not one way, one week and down the next. You need to cut Satan at his roots. So let's get into this, shall we? All right, go with me to our scripture. <laughs> All right, so look at what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 through 12 says. For you were once darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. What are we? What does the devil think about light? He runs from it. Remember that. Darkness flees from light. Satan is darkness. Walk as children of light. See, not only are you a light in the Lord, but now we need to do what? Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness. Be good, do good. Righteousness, being right with God. And truth. How many know we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free, Right? Verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Pay attention, because this is Halloween time. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. There's a whole bunch of secret societies, folks. And on these particular solstice time, their job is to curse the Christians and the Jews. 
what are the two nations that represent most Christians, the Christians and the Jews? Now, there's a lot of other Christian nations. Israel, U.S., but then there's India. Revival's breaking out in India. One's happening in China, believe it or not. Underground church is huge, millions. So the thing, the thing was, we never hear about that because the enemy doesn't want us to. But nevertheless, you should know it. If you're spending time with God, God should be letting you in on this stuff. I mean, he does. And so this is the rest of it. But all things are exposed and are made manifest by the what? So have you ever gone over to your relatives and as soon as you walked in, everybody put everything away? <laughs> I used to drive up some people, you know, and not tell them I'm coming. I don't do that anymore. Thank God you're safe. I'll drive up. You'll hear them. The windows are open, middle of summer. Honey, the pastor's here. Hide the bong and the beer. Put on your Jesus face. <laughs> So our life will show others their folly. You don't have to preach at anyone. Just love, walk in the light, and people will just fall under conviction. They just will. Read Smith Wigglesworth, uh, Ever Increasing Faith. He had a whole train full of Catholic priests that all fell on their knees and cried out, Man, you convict us of our sins. Yeah, he says, you're a bunch of sinners trying to represent God. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you what? Light. Now, why is that in there like that? You need a dose of light every day. How many here has ever used a flashlight? Now we have something real special. On the back of your phone, there's a flashlight. But if you don't keep the battery up, the light will go dim. So what that's saying is every day, Rise up and Christ will give you, Christ will clothe you, Christ will fill you, Christ will anoint you, Christ will walk in you, Christ will walk around you. So what verse 15 says, see then you walk uprightly, circumspectly, not as fools. What is a fool? I'm glad you asked me that question. The definition, biblical definition of a fool is a person that refuses to learn. Or cannot learn. That's none of you. Hey, say amen. But sometimes we get ourselves in a condition where we're not learning. Come to church and we're so tired we sleep. You better change some stuff. Satan's got you already. You don't hear a word you need to. So I'm not going to, this is not a pick on the congregation, but think about your life. When I was studying for the ministry, I was so tired. I had two children. I actually had three. One's in heaven. I had two children, a wife, full-time ministry, and worked at Boeing full-time. I was one tired cookie. Maybe sometimes only two or three hours of sleep at night kids crying and all that. So I learned how to pray. I learned how to pray. First time when I started really praying, God help! Lord, look at what our situation on. That's going on and going on. God says, Carrie, what are you doing? He says, Lord, I'm telling you how it is. And he says, I already know. You're not praying, Carrie. You're complaining. You always heard the story. And he says, if you will lean to me, I will give you the wisdom so your life takes on rest, peace, how I many know that God should lead us in peace? Not, we shouldn't be tormented all the time. We shouldn't be watching and see if people like us or not. If you're doing that, you're duped already. I don't care if you like me or not. I'm going to love you no matter what you do. You see? If I'm busy loving you and caring for you, I haven't got time to think of myself. See, thinking of self is a trick of the devil. I'm going to say it just the way it is. Me, myself, and I, I'm my own best friend. Hello. <laughs> All right, go with me to James chapter 1, verse 12 through 15. The devil has been stripped of all authority and only has the ability, listen, to deceive and tempt us. So all of the supernatural powers that Satan once had, he got from Adam, 
Jesus came and stripped him of that. And now Satan has his ability to con you and to tempt you. We see that in the temptations of Jesus. So every day Satan's job is to make you oppose God. Look at your neighbor and say, not me. Or if you can't do that, he'll get somebody to oppose you. I just don't like the way you're preaching, Carrie. Step right on in. You just stepped in Satan's trap. Whether you like it or not, get what you can. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Hello? Listen. And he says, listen, only the ability to deceive or tempt us. Con us. Jesus addressed him in John 10, verse 44. You are your father, the devil, for he was a liar and he was the opposer from the beginning. People that obey the devil and, or, or listen to him appear crazy and out of step. Crazy. What do you mean? They can't run schools. They can't run governments. They can't organize simple ministries to help mankind without loading their pockets full of stuff. Take a look at the society. Satan is trying to run everything. When people listen to him, they do crazy, uncommon sensed things. They don't have common sense about anything. It's all about them and how they can get ahead. And we want to not have that because that's Satan's trick. Where did he tell Eve? Ah, but God did not really say that. You're going to be just like him to get us to oppose the will of God for our life. To give us a bad attitude. We're supposed to be the happiest people in the world. Display it. Whether you feel like it or not. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. I love you. <laughs> All right. So listen to what James 1 says. Verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. Who's the tempter? The devil. And when he has been approved. In other words, Satan is, can't tempt you. And you've been approved. See, believe it or not, people who use this scripture here to say that God uses the devil to see how strong you are. There's a book out called Seduction of Christianity. Don't buy it. It's poisoned more people I've never known. Using Christian terms to twist. Intellectual Christianity is not a good thing. We call it religion. Okay, we call it religion. Best thing to do is be religious. Then you don't have to really add your heart to anything. But when we add our heart, here comes the weeping. And here comes the, the moaning and the getting ourselves right with God. Did you cry during any of the songs today? And if you did, wonderful. If you didn't, you sat there like a brick. Bricks are, the only thing for bricks is you, for you to be crushed and broken. Because you have made your own institution. And when somebody tickles your fancy, then you open up. No. You should be always open to God. Shut up to Satan. Say amen. Because once he's been approved, he will receive a crown of life. Which the Lord has promised to those that love him. Now what you don't understand is, once you pass the tempter's test. How long is that test, Pastor Kerry? All your life. Satan will come and go all your life to tempt you to try to deceive you. That is something that you just prepare yourself for. You don't expect him to get any victories, but you know that he's going to be coming from time to time. Be ready. Say amen. Just be full of the blood and full of God. Say amen again. There we go. Now listen. Let no one say when he is tempted, though, God is tempting me. In the, in the Old Testament, God showed people where they were at. He did that with Adam when he said, where are you? But he wasn't tempting them with evil. So let no one say that God is doing this to me to show me something. For God cannot be tempted with evil. That's what the rest of that says. Now, where does God live in you? Oh, I gave it away. Where does God live? In you. You all got it right. 
He lives in here. So the God in here is not going to put you through the mud and the crud and the flood. He's not tempting you. He's trying to lead you out of this planet. He's trying to get you away from your sin, away from all that stuff. But you got to listen to him. You got to meet with him. You got to surrender on a daily basis. Otherwise, you will become your own worst enemy and Satan will love every minute of it. He just has somebody insult you and your whole week is ruined. I've seen people some misunderstood what somebody said to somebody and their whole day was ruined. And then they took that ruin and brought it home to their wife and everybody else so they could be miserable with them. Crazy stuff. Are you with me? So it says, don't let God, anyone say that God is tempting me for God cannot tempt us with evil. Neither does he tempt any man. But each one is tempted. Now, this is what I want you to get. When he's drawn away by his own desires and lust and enticed. We'll just leave it up there. How do we get tempted? By our own flesh. By our own desires. So if you don't crucify your flesh and keep it under the Lord, your flesh will rise up and say, you've got to have another piece of pie. I'm just going to be funning with you. You got to go out and have, you know, party with your friends. You got to have a woman for a night. I mean, weird stuff. I mean, because the flesh is never satisfied. You ever notice that? When I was stoning and doing my thing and rock and roll, one beer was enough. I had to have five. You know, it's just you can't shut it down because the flesh is never satisfied because the nature of Satan is in our flesh. That's what makes you age. That's what makes you break down once in a while. So you bring that nature to God. You lay your body down before the Lord. He crucifies it, kills it. You pick it back on. You clothe yourself and you march out through your day in victory. Eyes off yourself. Eyes off the world. Eyes off others. And eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. He says, for the joy that's set before him. Did you know what God has for us when we get to heaven? It should be a joy set before you. You're already guaranteed heaven. You have Jesus in your heart. Are you going to give him up? Would you like to trade Jesus for what's behind curtain number one? Couple points. Number one. We are a fallen planet with a deceiver and enemy of all good. Never forget that. We will be tempted. We will be challenged. But he doesn't have any power to do anything to us. He only has the ability to cause fear so we believe for the bad. You'll say, well, nobody likes you. Just look how the pastors treated you today. He got on your case. Did I? Why do you think that way? Because you got a boogaloo dancing around your head telling you that. Stop listening to this. Have you ever been bored with your mind? I have. Come on, mind. Tell me something new. Uh. <laughs> Moving right along. Okay. Two, God's enemy he opposes God. He opposes his children. Everything that Satan does is to get you to oppose something. Then he feeds off you like some kind of mosquito. Have you ever sat on your back porch? I, I have a, a chair, two chairs on my back porch, one for my wife, one for myself. And I'll sit out there and I'll just look and watch the birds and everything. Every once in a while you hear, and it's near your ear and you're going, you know, I want to do that with my microphone. And you miss it. And then a little later, well, that's what the enemy's doing. He's buzzing around you. Look at where he can light and suck some blood out of you. No, you're sitting around with your hands slapping, man. You're going to get, you follow what I'm saying? So get the idea that if he can't irritate you, he's broken. If he can't upset you, he's broken. As soon as you start walking in love, forgiving easily, Meeting with God, Satan's inroads are broken and blocked. 
Do you see that? Can you see that in the word? I mean, religion's hidden that. But we're, we're totally covered. Totally covered. We're so covered that it's Satan. He, he loves to make jokes out of people who should know better. So he'll, he'll move us to a scenario where we have to apply the word of God and we don't apply the word of God because we're kind of acting like it was 20 years ago when everything we did was a play. You know, we didn't really seriously follow God because if we did, we would be totally changed. But if you did, you'll find out that Satan is just a big blowhard liar. His job is to make you and convince you to give him the power to slap you with it. Now everyone look at me and say, I'm not dumb enough to do that. I want you to believe that. I'm not dumb enough to do it. You got God, Holy Spirit, you got everything. Pay attention, slow down a little bit. Watch your lips, because oftentimes we'll open our mouth and we'll invite the devil to come right in and slap all this all around. I'm just no good. I'll never be any good. Bam, 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 the devil says, hey, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Bam, bam, bam. No, I'm a child of God. I'm forgiven of my sin. The only good I have is God in me. The rest die out. Now you're untouchable. You've jo broken every Satan's lie. If he can't convince you you're a worm, you'll never be one. If he can't convince you that you're going to have struggles all your life, you'll never have them. Because who do you walk with? Who walks in you? Who's for you? Who, who, who's against all evil? So guess what? Get together and do it right. Man, you, every time Peggy gets up in the morning, the devil goes, oh my God, I got a headache. And leaves. Because when you get up, meet with God, he's clothed you, he's filled you, he's cleansed you, he's washed you, except if you forgot to meet with God. He doesn't do it automatically. Well, it says walk in the light and then the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Walk in the light. There's the key. Walk in the light. It's in Christ. Light dispels all darkness. Salt shrivels a slug. Amen. God says, I want to take you like a city and I want to put you on a hill. So those that are lost and running around in the darkness may see the light in you and come and ask you why you believe what you do. Blessed is he that wins souls for their wise. All right, we're going to cover these four things. You're kidding. We already had a sermon, didn't we? All right, these four things we'll cover hopefully quickly and blessed. We will cover, number one, Jesus Christ has all authority in heaven and earth. Can I have an amen? amen. He says so. It's fact. Okay, so that makes you wonder where the enemy gets his. Two. In love, we are to walk in him. In love. Because this love of God. Now, this is not talking about human love. It's not talking about friendship love, uh, marriage love. It's not talking about partnership love. It's talking about the love of God that he's put in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. We're to walk in that love. That love doesn't notice the faults of others. That love does not write down little grudges and things they need to get even with. That love does not see any brokenness. That love sees hope and sees goodness. And you're filled with that love. Can you say amen? Because God is love. And where does God reside? In us too, right? So are you letting him take the lead? Or are you leading him? Moving right along. Third point we're going to cover. Is we are saved and filled with God, right? Avoid every division that there is. Whether you agree whether you like the rapture or believe in a rapture or not shouldn't be the issue. The issue should be winning souls, serving Christ, and loving one another. Amen. Okay. I believe in a pre-rapture, but, you know, there's seven of them. Most Christians have never studied that much. 
So they don't know that there's Enoch, Elisha, Jesus. That's the first three. The church, mid-tribulation company, 144,000. And then finally, the two squirrely witnesses, Elijah and Enoch, because they haven't died yet. See, Moses is not one of the two witnesses because Satan wanted Moses' body. If you die, you have a body you left behind. Okay, So it's Elijah. So good teaching here will straighten out some of the confusion that's out there. And then finally, number four, our flesh is not our friend. Satan needs your flesh to be his buddy. And he'll leave you alone for a while, but he knows, let's say he knows the term, you'll never amount to anything is your trigger. So you're serving God and you're doing all that and everything's going good. And suddenly somebody out of the blue says, you know, you're never going to amount to anything. And boom, all hell breaks loose because that triggered you from the spirit realm into the flesh. These things you need to avoid like the plague and recognize when that happens, who's really doing it? Not the poor guy that made the statement. He's just the dumb dumb. But the enemy behind the person doing it. That's what you bind. Can you say amen? So, we'll cover those four things. Let's look at the first one. Jesus Christ has all authority in heaven and earth. Let me see the hands of those who believe that. If your hand's not up, then you're already deceived. Every bit of authority is given to Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And what did he tell for us to do? He says, now that I have this authority, you go in my name. In other words, I'm going to go with you. You're going to have me in you. And you're going to go with that same authority. All right. So let's look at it. Matthew 28, please. Verses 18 through 20. Everyone say baptized. Baptized. That baptism there. Remember there's three. That baptism there is being born again. Okay, it is not baptizing in water. Because I know there are people in heaven never did get baptized in water. They just couldn't. God going to say no? See, that's what religion does. S- excludes everybody. See, what Satan has done is, we're all, there, how many churches are there worldwide? One. Come on. See, already divided. There's only one, but it has many names. But why are those people with those names against the people down the street with, that are the same Jesus, just has a different name? Satan's trick. Satan always picks on, puts down, tries to get you to compartmentalize, to put things in judgments and stuff. Oh, I know, sister, you're one of them. Already I'm in Satan's hand by doing that. Well, doesn't the Lord want us to hate sin? Yes. Does he want us to oppose the devil? Yes. That's fair game. But to oppose the truths of God, to oppose one another, to have arguments over our baseball team, that's got to be ignorance gone to seed. Think about ignorance gone to seed. Arguing over who's the best. My sister always used to say, Mom loved you better than me. I said, that's not so. You got more clothes. Anyway, you know, the, the, the whole exchange. That's why we're not to compare ourselves. We're to just be the best that we can be. Do it all the time. Let God change us. Say amen. All right. So Matthew 28 verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority. How much? Say it again. Has been given to me in heaven and earth. Where? Satan, you're served notice. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means get them born again. Okay? And then it says, and Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them. See? Teaching them now. You, you, You just don't baptize people. You have to teach them what it is. Teaching them things which I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. As Christians, we have Jesus in our hearts, right? We have the same authority because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What we must stay in harmony with heaven 
in harmony with God's love. It's called the unity of the spirit. When we're that way as a unit, as a church, Satan can't get in here either. See, it doesn't matter my opinion against yours. Uh Uh-uh. Forget about thinking that stuff. It's not opposing one another. It's uniting unto God. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. That we're all in one accord in unity. See, the major thing we're to do is to please God, love God, love each other, and grow. Amen. So a couple of things. As Christians, we have Jesus in our hearts too. The believer has the same authority because Jesus is in here. And then thirdly, we, where does the enemy get his power? Now, now before we just do that, I want you to think about that. He gets it from lying to us and we listen and we give him that power. If he somehow tells us, you know, Sherry really doesn't like you, Nancy. We don't, I don't think we have a Nancy. And Nancy goes, why, oh, why, oh, why? See, she's already under that sway. And Sherry has no idea. She doesn't know. Why are you so mean to Sherry? Sherry's going, I didn't think I was. Now you see the stirring. Here's another one Satan uses. And if it fits a little bit, please don't get mad at me because... First of all, I don't preach at you. I'm not trying to control you with my words. I'm not going to say you're missing it and secretly, subliminally say things. Once in a while, maybe. <laughs> Listen, the worst place for you to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend is at church. Because everybody's supposed to be focusing on God, not you sitting next to them. Quiet. No how It just went. Mm-hmm. No, how many times in my church? I mean, I had a huge church. So you're talking about 500 plus people, relationships and things going on. It's just crazy. And and, and Scott and and Peggy will relate to that. They, They remember being there. But you don't come to church to find a girlfriend nor a boyfriend. You come to church for God. So make sure why you come to church is holy. Hello? Because if, 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 that girlfriend or boyfriend, are you supposed to be together? Worst thing you can do to ruin it is put them before God. Cha-cha-cha. Here's at you. So don't do that. You want the relationship to work? You put God first. Bible study, you be there whether your girlfriend is not. Hello. So you can get the word God needs for you to get. Let me ask you, do you think I'm doing this for popularity? Why am I doing what am I doing? God told me to do it. And God told me that you will be coming. Right? I'm not here to honor myself. So if I do tell you a cautionary, it's for you to pay attention and pray about it. Okay? Remember, a selfish person always feels like they're under attack. Okay? A dead person never gets offended, always wants to know more. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. All right. Go with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 18 through 20. I want you to see how powerful you are. Now, how many know there's an Old Testament and New Testament? When God picked his disciples, Jesus picked his disciples, they were in the what testament? Amen. But he still gave them authority over all the authority of the enemy. Are you got it? Luke chapter 10, verse 18. We read this a couple of times before, but we'll read it again. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven. Let me ask you, when did Satan fall from heaven? Gosh, you guys, you should know this like the back of your hand. Before Adam and Eve were created, God threw him out of heaven because he opposed God. What does Satan feel up, feed on? A p- opposition. So he got all of us, one third of all of the workers that God sent down on this planet to work for God, to rebel against God. He turned them against God and started feeding off of them. Attack God before Adam and Eve were created. 
So here God could not stop his plan. Well, why didn't God just stop Adam and Eve from being in and deal with the devil? Because once God sets something in motion, he can't stop it. That's why when, when Satan fell, he couldn't just annihilate him and make him exist no longer. He made him to live forever and to serve him forever. So when he fell, he's going to be evil for until he's put in the lake of fire. That's why we have hell. It was for the devil and his angels, never for a human being. Put in the lake of fire because they cannot be annihilated. They cannot stop from existing. So they have to be caged up for eternity. Say, I learned something new. Same with you. You're an eternity creature. You're an eternal creature. When you accept Jesus Christ, you have the guarantee of becoming immortal. Not a God, but an immortal person with a glorified body that will be able to serve God and travel at the speed of sound and thought and light. Any speed you want to travel at. We'll come back on the earth and we'll teach and we'll help Jesus back on the earth after the millennium. Somebody say amen. So he says, look, I, felt, I saw Satan fall. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall hurt you. This Old Testament, isn't it? What do you suppose it's like in the New Testament? Much better. See, we, we always take ourselves and put us on the lower level somewhere in the Old Testament saying, God, just get me through this. You can just get me through this. And God said, I've been trying, but you're holding on to all the wrong things. Moving right along. Verse 20 says, nevertheless, do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, let me ask you, See how well you retain. When was your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Before the foundation of this world. God purpose and plan for you to be before him in love. Ephesians chapter uh, 1 verse 5. So, but Satan interrupted that, didn't he? Adam gave in to him. Don't you dare give in to the enemy. You live for Jesus. Stop excusing yourself. And start living for God. Can you say amen? Until we're off this planet. Folks, we never really begin to live until we're off this planet. God says, I'll help you. I'll do great things. But don't, don't think it any, any problem that you get fiery trials once in a while to come to try you. That's just what the devil does. He says, when you're there, be ready for him. Every day you're alert and prepared because you meet with God. That's it. The poor turkey if you're stupid enough to attack you when you're meeting with God you're going to get wiped out slapped all down and ruined his old day is going to be ruined because you're a child of the living God all right I want you to note something later on these same disciples that had all this authority okay later on couldn't even heal a paralytic boy now pay attention You'll find this in Mark chapter 9. Jesus said, hey, why couldn't you? The disciples said, we can't cast the devil out. Why couldn't we cast out? Jesus said, this devil comes out by fasting and prayer. Now, I know some of you have never fasted. Maybe you ought to just to check out or read about it. Come to me and I'll talk, I'll talk to you about it. You don't have to fast everything. You could fast your newspaper, your TV program. I mean, there's things you can do. But anyway, this kind comes out by fasting and prayer. Nevertheless, oh, perverse generation, how long do I have to be with it? Bring the child to me. And then he cast the devil out. But the disciples came to him privately and says, hey, how can we cast, how come it didn't work? We were casting him out before Jesus. And Jesus opens his mouth and he says in Mark 9, what were you arguing amongst yourself? along the way do you see it why were what were you arguing about while you were on the way to get people healed you started arguing amongst yourself what were you arguing about jesus was confronting them oh we were arguing on who's the greatest in the kingdom 
Good way to lose all the power that God gives you. Walk around like you're the greatest. It's quiet in here. God resists the, gives grace to the, your greatness dies every day. You play the guitar, you want to play it better? Then say, Lord, I'm willing to put this guitar down so that when I pick it up again, I'll do it for you. I did that with the drums. And he says, the next time when you pick it up, you'll be playing for me. So if you read it, Mark 9, verses 33 through 35, you'll see that Jesus called them out. Why you guys don't have any more power is you're too busy arguing. What's Satan feed on? Opposition, Opposition to one another, arguing, comparisons. I'm better than you. You just lost. Start your day again. <clears throat> Do over. All right. Okay, my second point. In love, we are to walk in him. Say amen. Go with me to 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 9. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God. Now, it's talking about agape love, not the human love. You see, the agape love doesn't respond to people's rudeness. You see, when somebody comes to me and asks me to be their friend, I'll always love them and be their friend. But that means I also tell them the truth. You see, there is no carry over here and carry pastor over here. It's all one big package. So if you start acting goofy, don't be surprised by saying, stop acting goofy. <laughs> That's what a friend does. Okay, move right along. So we're to walk in love. Is God to be our friend? Yes. Come on, you hesitated. Of course, let me ask you, what are you doing to be a friend of God? No, don't give me an answer. I'm asking you, what are you doing daily to become God's friend? Can he trust in you? Sure he can, if you meet with him often enough. What are you doing to be a friend of God? Amen. So let's read the rest of this. He that loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the fact that God is love, was manifested, manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world. Now listen to the next phrase. That we might live, that we might live, notice the term, through him. You see, we live through him, not for him. I say it again. We do live for him. But that's what a lot of Christians are doing. They're working hard living for him. When they need to die and let him live through them and we live through him. Say amen, somebody. That's the way we're supposed to walk. You see, when I lay my hands on the sick, it's no longer my hand. I see God's hand around my hand and I just release God through my arm. Bible says lay hands on the sick and they shall cover, recover. Okay? Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You don't heal them. You just release the healer. Can you release the healer out of your lips? Yeah, you can. Can you release the healer out of your eyes? Yes, you can. These are gates. I open my, I, I used to set people up and when I taught about the power of God, I said, what I'm going to do is close my eyes. I want you to close your eyes. And when I open them, power God's going to jet out of my eyes and, and zap you. Are you ready for this? I says, open your eyes. I open their eyes and boom, onto the floor they went. Why? We can project God through us. He wants us to live through him and allow him to project through us. Can you say amen? So there has to be a lot of us decreasing so God in us increases. Say amen. 
Because whether we know it or not, we can resist God from using us just because our mind's on us, not on him. So, we as believers are to walk in Christ's love towards one another. That's how we keep the armor on. The armor's light. Two, being with God, walking in love, causes us to unify with each other. To find out each other's blessing and to unify because there's power in numbers. One could put a thousand, two, ten thousand, three, hundred thousand, four, a million. To flight, backing off Satan. Amen. Listen to what this says. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. Here Paul is writing. He says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. Now, let me just tell you, we don't have any divisions here. None of you are irritated with me. At least I don't know it. So for those coming in camera, we don't have any divisions here. But we need to avoid any divisions. What does Satan feed on? Division, strife, all of those things. How can he get to you? By upsetting you and having you act on that. Now, naturally, there are things that upset us. We can go right with, to God about it and cast it over on him. We don't have to carry it around. Say amen. Yep. No divisions among you. 1 John 4, 17 through 19 says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. So everyone say, I could be a sinner or I could be a saint. God made me a saint. So I won't act like a sinner. You notice, you know, Christians getting upset, yelling at one another. Satan loves it. He loves it. You go to the store and you find somebody else that believes everything is kosher. You're talking about God and everything until you bring up your church. And they go, oh, you're one of them. See how he works? You're either a Democrat or a Republican. <laughs> he doesn't care as long as you fight. As long as you argue. As long as you stir up. Even Michael the archangel did not bring railing accusations against the devil personally. Because he knew that would be wrong. He just simply said, the Lord rebukes you. Everyone say, Satan, the Lord rebukes you. His face is against you. And I'm covered in the blood. And I have a covenant. You see, those very words that you say, you just establish you as untouchable in the spirit. Remember when you accepted Jesus? Remember that day? There wasn't a devil in hell that could stop you. He can't really stop you. He just tries to convince you he can. No. He can't stop you from going to heaven. So he might want to talk you into giving up the game. Would you like to trade your salvation? What's behind curtain number two? Next point. We are saved and filled with God Avoid divisions. Go with me to James chapter 3, please. Verse 13 through 18. I'll try to finish up real quick. One more point after this. James 3, 13 through 18. It says, who is wise and understanding among you? Everyone lift your hands. That's me. <laughs> Let him show out of a good conduct or the way he lives, his works done in meekness of wisdom. Meekness is not weakness. Just because you can crush somebody's hand when you shake it, don't. I mean, the way I can tell how carnal people are is when they grab you by the hand and they crush your hand. And they're looking at you like, you wimp. Total pride. Satan loves it. God hates it. And yet we go around doing all that. You are your worst enemy at times. Just stop it. Say amen. amen. 
I don't want to get too down home and we're all liable to lose our joy. And I don't want to do that. And I says, listen, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking, I got to do this and I got to do that in your hearts. Do not boast and lie against the truth. Good idea, right? This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where there's envy, self-seeking, where there exists, there's confusion and every evil thing. Remember, Satan needs that to come in and, and fester and feed. Hello? So he stirs up strife in the church. Or different than the rich. You don't treat the people that are challenged than the people that are not. You love them all the same. Say amen, somebody. And it says, and full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown, sown, sown in peace by those who make peace. Blessed be the peacemaker, for they shall be called the sons of God. All right. Are you with me? Romans 16, verse 17. Listen to this. Now I urge you, brethren, note or mark, the old King James says, those who cause divisions among you. You got somebody coming in and says, I just don't like what you're doing. And they interrupt the service. It says to mark them and keep no company with them. Whoa. Because the person's coming in and creating division. Does God want us divided? He wants us united, doesn't he? Satan's biggest key is what he does to get people into opposition. So united will stand, divided will. Satan's job is to get you off by yourself. Make you feel you're the only one. Remember Elijah? Oh God, he's hiding in the cave. Oh God, everybody's not serving. I'm the only one left. And God says, no, you're not. I got 5,000 right down here. You're so into what you're suffering, you forgot what I'm doing. You're so into what you're doing, you forgot what I can do. So we need to repent. Just say, God, I'm sorry. I have been. I've been a bad boy, a bad girl. And go to him about it. Please don't do it in service. That's, you say, why don't you have altar calls? Because that's old-fashioned. If God tells me to have an altar call, I will. But if you have a, a little guilt problem, I'm not going to have you come to the altar and put you on the spot. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awful? Amen. Same Baptist people getting saved every weekend. Same six. You know, just a different guilt. Move right along. Okay, last point. Romans 6, now I urge you, brethren, mark them that cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine that you have learned and avoid them. For those that are such do serve their own belly, not Jesus Christ. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, I've seen all kinds of that stuff through the years. People come in and right in the middle of the word stand up and start prophesying. I said, shut up and sit down. Wouldn't do it. So I had my ushers carry him out. That's something to see. <laughs> Listen, God never interrupts himself. Yeah, he never does. The person that interrupts what God is doing, like preaching or whatever, is totally being selfish at the moment. They think what they have to say is more important than what God is saying. It's a trick. Hang with me. We'll teach you a whole lot more. So what is Satan's biggest trick for you? What does he do for every believer, every human? What does he try to do? What? Deception. No. Get you to oppose people. Get you to oppose yourself. Sure, that's deception, but that's too vague. Get you in opposition 
and in strife and in frustration all the time. We call it stress. He feeds off of it. There's an energy that comes out of that. Even, even scientists will tell you that you can stress yourself to death. So that energy he feeds off of. So why bother to get stressed? Meet with God. Give it to God. Move right on. Find out what God wants you to do. Get after it. Get after it. Stop looking around. He that's running a race doesn't look wherever all the other runners are. No, he's focused on the finish line. Focus on the finish line. Not yourself, how good you're accepted or not. I've done preach myself happy and I've talked to all of us. Satan, remember, these are the last days. He wants a, God wants us to lift above the, the beggarly elements of this world. And to be the champions God's called us to be doesn't matter what background you have. But it's not going to happen if you're doing it. Last point. Our flesh is not our friend. Go with me to Romans chapter 7, verse 21 through 25. This is Paul the apostle. Before he became an apostle, he's talking about him being a, under the law as a Pharisee. He said, as long as I try to follow the law, there's something present with me that's evil. What's he talking about? What's the very thing that you have that's evil that's always present with you? Your flesh. Should you trust it? How about your feelings? Are they from your, your spirit or your flesh? So can you trust them? Feelings are okay if they follow your faith. But if your feelings are telling you nobody likes you and you're going on that, fall down and eat dirt until you're tired of it and get up and start being a man or a woman. Say amen. I mean, I'm serious. God went through hell and back to get you to be a child of the living God and you're doing great at it. Don't make a mockery of God by thinking of yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, amen. He says... I find a law that evil is present with me. I got the hiccup, sorry. That one who wills to do good. I want to do good, but evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God according to my inward man. That's the spirit man. But I see another law in my members, my flesh, worn against the law of my mind. See, all three there. Spirit, flesh, mind. Bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. The nature of my flesh, which is in my members, my flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of? Notice it's called the body of death. Your flesh is not going. Bathe it, feed it, brush its teeth, comb its hair. But that's the, all the only attention you give it. Don't bring it to church with you. Leave it in the car. So when you come in, you're a bright, shiny one and not a, a mudge fudget. We're not drawing attention to ourselves. We're drawing attention to God. Pointing, everyone's pointing to God. Say amen. I sure love you. Boy, I tell you what, a, this is a good one. Break Satan's power every time. Meeting with God, walking in love, and refusing to be at odds with anything. Except for sin and the devil, of course. So it goes on further and it says this. It says, the, after the inward, but I see another law, my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man, who will deliver me? Who delivers us? Amen. Amen. So notice, in our flesh is the nature of sin. We fail every time. Even if you do something good from your flesh, it doesn't register with God. You could build a hospital and not be saved. It doesn't go for anything. You won't even make heaven. I mean, it'll be written down that you did good, but you won't be there for God to enjoy you because you never surrendered and accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Do you remember the first day you did that? If you're not quite clear that you said, Jesus, I surrender, forgive me my sin, come into my heart. If you can't remember that day, then you better pray that prayer again and make sure that you're saved. Because some people go to church, but they don't become a Christian. 
You can hear all the good things and have a good heart, but is it really good? Moving right along and finishing. Did you notice that when he wanted to do good, evil was present with him? To the devil needs for us to yield to his lies and his deception so he has power over us. If we don't do that, does he have power over us? No. If you refuse to be distracted and focused rather on God, not distracted, can he get your attention? No. You ever notice the devil tries to get people's attention? If he can't get it, he'll make a noise. He'll do something weird to get us to look over there and comment. He's always trying to get attention. But we're too busy paying attention to God and winning souls, amen, to be lured away by his suggestions. So, did you get it? How to break Satan's power every time? Get up in the morning, you feel like 100 pounds of sin on a popsicle stick. You just open up and talk, start talking with God. Because Satan will give you lies in your dreams. How many's ever had a bad dream? You can wave at me. Every one of you. Satan sees to it. So, if you don't want a bad dream anymore, how many here don't want a bad dream anymore? You simply, when you go to bed, you unload your package, say, Lord, everything I've done during the day exposed to negativity, I cast over on you, and everyone listen, I plead the blood of Jesus over my dreams, my mind, and my body. So I will rest, and my rest will be sweet, and I will wake up refreshed. Use that prayer or something that's close to it. Absolutely works. You'll never have a bad dream again. Except for the time you forget that. Now, just, just one last phrase. I remember when I first got saved, Satan's an intimidator and he'll try. He used to leap. No, I don't believe or any of that. He would leap on my chest and take the air out of my mouth. In my dreams. He wouldn't do this when I was awake because I'd beat the tar out of him. He'd wait till I'm asleep and then he'd jump on me and I'd have a weird dream and I would be trying to say, Jesus, Jesus, get him off of me. Nothing would come out. You ever have one of those? That's called an intimidation dream because you're starting to grow. He wants to intimidate you to stop. So he'll attack you when you're asleep and something like that. So you just plead the blood of Jesus. You just cover yourself with it and you just say, Lord, Cut a couple of angels in my bedroom to watch over me while I rest. Carrie, you just talk like you like you're saved or something. You talk like you like God really loves and cares for us. Like he doesn't want us to suffer. Hello? Yeah, you're getting it. Now I didn't say you wouldn't, you will. But we're trying to minimize that and cut his power into your life. I must say. Scott knew me a long time ago. Peggy knew me a long time. I, I much preach with greater wisdom now than I ever did before. Because I found out if you only get sections of the gospel, then we're kind of lopsided. So make sure that you didn't just get sections of the gospel, that you're getting the full gospel meal. Amen. And you will hear. And another thing, let me encourage you. You're not asking me any questions. Carrie, how do I move in the spirit? Carrie, how do I flow into gifts? Carrie, how do I keep myself protected? You guys don't ask me any of those questions as if you already know. And I know most of you don't. So would you please help me help you by asking some questions so we can address it and give you what you need to know. Someone say amen. All right, so if you got some place in your body that needs healing, put your hand on it. Just put your hand on it. Okay. <laughs> I don't have enough hands. Just surrender. And remember, it's all in receiving. You have all the faith you'll ever need to receive. Who lives in you? The only reason we don't is sometimes we run to the medicine cabinet too quickly. Instead of waiting and listening to God. Nothing wrong with taking medicine. I'm not one of those avoid doctors. I don't believe in that. But if you are going to trust some, trust God first. 
And then if nothing else is working, your faith is not quite working, then go. But go in faith. Take your medicine in faith, not in fear. Say amen, somebody. Our Lord bless you and keep you. Watch over you. Lord, if people got their touch in their life, heal their body. There's somebody in here with a little arrhythmia in the, in the heart area. Just a slight arrhythmia. You can tell because there's a, a niche. Lord's healing that right now. If you'll receive it, you have to receive it in Jesus' name. God's healing any cancers. There's somebody in here that has tendency to a kidney stones. That's when you don't have enough fluids going through your body and you're not drinking enough milk. Some doctors will tell you you have too much calcium. No, you don't have enough. That's why it's taking it from your bones and giving you arthritis and then making little rocks in your kidneys. So melt, yeah, Lord's melting that condition right now in Jesus' name. I see a situation at home. God s says to you that he's going to deal with your, your parents and their lives are going to change here in the months to come. So be ready for that. Lord, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. You might have some spouse or somebody that you love dearly that seems to be that resistant, always resisting. God says, if you'll just continue to remind him, he'll melt, melt that down in Jesus' name. Now, let, look at me. Does God know how to get and touch and reach everybody? So when you pray for somebody that's like resisting, just say, Lord, you know how to reach them. You know how to reason with them. You know how to get right to their heart and massage it. And so pray that way. Give, all you need to give God is invitation. He's just waiting to be invited. Our scripture says that. So you got a hard person that you're praying for and you want to change? Lord, I invite you in to change them, but you include and change me while you're at it. You see, then Satan can't accuse you if he ever catches wind that you're praying for everybody else to change. And Satan will say, well, they're not praying for themselves. So remember, you do not have a friend in your flesh. So treat it as your slave. You know, you know, when a slave does what a slave does, and I'm not referring to a slavery, but when you have a slave, the slave does what they're supposed to do, and you don't ask them, how do you like your job? No, they're a slave. That means they do what they're supposed to do, and you get rid of them. Well, that's what God says about your faith. Your faith is your slave. You don't pamper your faith. You release your faith. Let it do what it's supposed to do. The faith in you, God, will bring you to the other side. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of you?